Here we are, the very first roller that was produced in Germany a couple of years ago. We are holding it because this was a great excitement. Hundreds of people have been trying to make this roller. They gave up because their thinking was wrong. That's all that was wrong. They got the roller out and it kept cracking. That is my safety net. No one is going to copy that roller unless they're working full heart with me. You can spend as much as you like and I would think there must be about 10 million pounds spent by so many people trying to make that one roller. This is the uh, magnetizing equipment. Here we are just making test models so we don't need a very big machine. Again, you see another view. If you notice, there is a number of coils involved. This again is slightly different to normal practice. Another view of the coils. Another view. So anyone wishing to make the, these rollers realize you've got to have a, have a bit of patience and I mean patience, and don't give up. Now, you may say, why can't you make it? Well, let's put it this way. If you make a house brick, you've got to buy the ovens and all the necessary equipment to make that one brick. That costs you a fortune. That's the same here. To make one roller, you may be looking at 12 million pounds. So you've got to make millions of them, because after the first one, they cost very little to make. That first one is the bug. <laughs> Here is the magnetic field around the first segments produced in Germany. By the way, these pictures are in the books. So those who, who want to study them more closely can do so. Now, here is the illustration of the SUG build-up. Can we show the plates uh, with the pointer, please? You notice that is what we call the plate in which the rollers run on. That's what we call the roller, and these have to be slightly shorter than the plate, so they have free movement. We show here the coil uh, which we build on the outside of the last ring, which supplies the final work. The only difference between this machine and the conventional machine is that this is the prime mover. The coils is standard practice. Notice we've shown four colors. That represents the, the different layers of elements which are compressed to form the plate the same must apply to the rollers. The weight of, or the volume of the plate must be equal to the weight or volume, whichever you like to say, of the roller. Therefore, each roller in itself is a generator of its own. Here is a magnetic demonstration which so many people witness. There are letters in the books of people from Australia who saw this demonstration. This particular one is from the report of Gunnar Sandberg of Sussex University. Unfortunate, he gives you a slight wrong explanation. He says, when you place the roller at the edge, it accelerates to its cruising speed. He could not tell you it instant go to cr the cruising speeds. The other people tell you in their report it goes instant to the cruising speed. Why should Gunnar Sand Sandberg say it accelerates? The reason is this. He works in the electrical department of Sussex University. He should know why it goes instant 
and he does not know. It baffles him. If I was in his place, I would say, this go goes instant to cruising speed, but at this time, I cannot explain why. But we will investigate it and tell you when we know. It would be much, shall we say, polite, much more professional than the way he went about it. You see, as we, ex we shall explain a little later why it goes instant to its cruising speed. Now, this is the reason why the roller rotates. We have four elements. You see the color shown each element. What is happening? We have energized with DC, and on this DC, we have used AC. The AC and the DC must be switched on exactly at the same instant. The AC must be at zero point, and it must be on the upward climb. It must switch off at zero point on the complete of a cycle. If you fail to get that right, the AC will erase the DC. But if you get that timing dead right, you left with thousands of little pinpricks of forces. It is difficult at this time to say if these are true magnetic uh, points or whether we have got surges of electrons on one side and surges of holes on the other side. But one thing is certain, that if the plate and the roller are it, uh, magnetized precisely the same, we have a strange position. And it says, you have got one pole there, but you don't have a pole there. The pole is over here. The next pole is above, that is not in line. You have a wave. What happens is that when you place the roller on that plate and you let go, the magnetic field lifts the roller. But at the moment this happens, eddy currents form. It pulls the roller down. If your sums are right, they balance to a point where the roller floats. It does not touch the surface. There is such a torque that the roller must rotate, and it rotates on its axis. Now, if we only have two lines of magnetic force on each end and two on the plate, it sits there, smiling at you. <laughs> and that's no good to us. So what do we do about it? The answer is simple. Do something. I take the bar, I cut it in eight segments. Now, I do the energizing again on each segment. Now we have something completely different. We have still got the two outer ones, and they fit on the plate with the two on the plate. And a roller cannot move either way, sideways. But now, you see, we have gotten six more runs of these mysterious poles. They are exerting a force on the plate. So it accelerates. Another beautiful thing about this it's you just drop it on the plate, and away it goes. And they say, how did you do that? I didn't do it, that did it. I look at this and I say, why do we always take the hard road? Because when you drop the next one in, it just sorts itself out. It finds its opposite point to the one operating. Every roller must go the same way. No matter how many plates you have, they will always go the same way. Now the question is, how do we find how many rolls you want on the first plate? Because we obviously need to know that we've got a steady output. Well, the sum is quite easy. You take square three, you know the answer. You're all going to say nine. You're wrong. It's nine fields. Every field has a value. 
When you calculate these values out, it is the sum of each column or each row or the diagonal. It's the answer to the mature quantity you need. Every element is defined by that square that you're going to use. It is the right assembly of this material that makes this technology possible. When you do the magnetizing of each segment, if you've got your sums right and you powder it with fine dust, you're looking at a magnetic field you have never seen. It is a bicycle wheel. It is exactly the spikes of a wheel. When you turn it up on its running edge, you just have this wave pattern. It's holding it separate, that's nothing. There's no reaction, nothing. As soon as you put it on the plate, you have instant reaction. But it is instant. Whatever the cruising speed is, it travels instantly, it's free to go. There is no acceleration. We'll now take the next view. As you see, what we have is actually two waveforms going one di direction, and then we actually got two others going in the opposite direction. we we'll look at the next. <laughs> now, this is an uh, enlargement of one of the plates, and this actually is a true plate. We give the measurements, we show you the ingredients we use. As you see, we use a rare earth at our outer edge. Then you see we use a nylon. And I like to say, why I fancy nylon? We can use plastic, but in Germany we see, when I look at the finished thing, that the, nylon, uh, the plastic looks terrible crude. It looks hard, it looks brittle, and we believe that nylon gives a better finish. It's, it's an uh, insulant, uh, insulator, it has a double gate. But there are three classes of nylon 6.6. That's what we call a positive charge. This is where the manufacturer takes away electron from each molecule. You can have a neutral, which is the standard one. Then you can have a negative charge. This is where they add an extra electron to each molecule. And it's the negative one I use. Next to that, we take an ingredient. It can be iron or any other the, uh, magnetizing materials. And then on the outer coat, we put one which will not magnetize, but it must produce an eddy current when a magnetic field get, comes in touch with it. That is the basic of it. We'll explain how and why it works later. This is how the SEG looks. We only use three plates. You can use four or five, but then you've got to consider if you're rich. If you're rich, of course, you can put more plates on. But this is a prime mover. It can be used as a home domestic power plant, which is, we are now developing. It can be used as a car engine. It can either be put straight in the wheels, or it can be put in where your engine is and four electric motors, one on each wheel. You've got the energy, you can run at mains, you can run higher if you wish. We can also use it for power and trains, we can use it for aircraft, and it is used on a very large scale, scale to power our levity discs, as they were called. Here is basically what they look like. If you can consider a ball race, as we call them in England, that is exactly what you're looking at in the gener this generator, except you do not need any housing or cage to hold them. This is one ring and the rollers to give some idea of what we're talking about. This is a completed one. 